This story is brought to your ears by all our fantastic supporters on Patreon. To get in on the action yourself with bloopers, extras, and the occasional early story, join us at patreon.com slash voiceofallmtg. We'd like to thank our newest patrons, Julian Imholz and Paul Wellen, for already donating. For more stories or just a chat, visit voiceofallmtg.com. And now. Voice of All presents Return to Dominaria, Episode 5. Thank you for meeting me here. I assume you want me to help the planeswalkers you told me about. Joyra and Ajani Goldmane stood on the newly constructed bridge of the Weatherlight. It was raised and suspended across the stern of the ship with big windows that stretched from one wall to the other, providing a broad view of the bright morning sky of Bogarden, the workers' camp, and the beach and cove below. The others were out on the open deck below the bridge, where Tiana and Arvad were helping Shauna and Rath bring the rest of the supplies aboard and stow them below decks. Ajani's sudden appearance had caused some confusion, Even to people accustomed to magic, it was startling to see a tall, muscular humanoid with white fur and the head of a one-eyed predator cat materialize out of thin air. Fortunately, most of the work crew had already boarded the supply ship for their voyage home, and Hadi and Tien and the few others who had remained on the beach to say goodbye to Joyra were used to strange occurrences. Joyra had only met Ajani once before, then briefly, when he had told her he was a planeswalker and asked for her help. They had arranged to meet again here, but Joyra had meant to arrive early enough to be able to reacquaint herself with the completed weatherlight first. Now she had to make herself concentrate on the conversation, when all she really wanted was to run her hands over the smooth new wood of the ship's navigation console to take the stairs at the back of the bridge and go down to examine the rebuilt engines and explore the maze of cabins and common rooms in the galley. Malimo's seed had clothed the skyship's bones in a way that was both completely different and hauntingly familiar. Yes, we must meet them. He didn't seem to notice Joyra's distraction, obviously occupied with his own concerns. Whatever he was about to say, he seemed reluctant to get on with it. But first, I must ask. Were you aware the planeswalker called Karn was found and rescued from the Phyrexians? And that he has returned to Dominaria? No, it wasn't. Are you certain? The shock and the rush of relief made her heart pound. Ajani nodded gently. Jorah turned away and covered her face, wanting the well of emotion to be private. Her mechanical owl landed on her shoulder, chirping anxiously, drawn by her sudden agitation. I'm all right. With a thought, she sent it down the stairwell hatch and out to the weatherlight's deck. She took a deep breath and turned back to Ajani to ask where Karn was. Ajani's features were so different it was hard to read his expressions but the dismay in his gaze was eloquent. Is something wrong? Is Karn hurt? Not hurt. You also knew the planeswalker Venser? Joyra noted the past tense and felt sick. Yes. Please, just tell me what happened. (sighs) Venser gave up his spark to Karn to rescue him. Venser did not survive. Jora paced away toward the compass stand, running a hand through her hair. She didn't want to believe it, but it was exactly the kind of thing Vincer would do. After her relief for Karn, this was a crushing sadness. Vincer had been barely older than Raff when she had known him, and she had loved him as a friend, though he had felt more for her. Is this why Karn hasn't come to find me? Ajani shook his head. I don't know, but it seems a natural assumption. I'll have to find him. Karn was her friend, too, and their grief for Vincer was shared. She rubbed her eyes. There were other things to deal with first. 
And Phyrexia? An entire plane has fallen to them. But they've been contained there. No other planes should be in any danger. Jorah wanted to ask more, but she heard Tiana call to her from the deck. The weatherlight was ready to get underway, and she didn't want to waste another moment. The work to come would be a welcome distraction. She ran her hands over the navigation console, grounding herself. Thank you for bringing me this news. It can't have been an easy burden. Let's fetch your friends, shall we? Ajani nodded, his expression gentle obviously recognizing the hollowness of her smile and her desire for privacy. The gates to Benalia City were impressive, constructed of the magical Benelish stained glass, gleaming in the bright morning sun. They were well over four stories high, set in soaring gray stone walls, topped with narrow towers and arches. Gideon would have appreciated the sight more if the passage inside hadn't been blocked at the moment. A dozen battle angels had planted themselves across the roadway, stopping not only their party, but all the market wagons and other travelers trying to get in around them. Gideon was on horseback and didn't bother to dismount. Behind him were Liliana and a small troop of Rail's men-at-arms. Is there a problem? I am Lyra Dawnbringer, commander of the Angels of Serra. Your companion stinks of death magic and will not be allowed into this city. Oh, please. Gideon drew in a calming breath. This was no time for a fight, particularly with people who should be their allies. You see we travel with soldiers of Benalia. You and they are welcome. The necromancer is not. Gideon was not in the mood. It had been a long ride here, and he knew Rail's Avon messengers had already carried word of the battle ahead of them. The Necromancer is a demon slayer. She has already killed three demons, and was instrumental in defeating the Cabal in Caligo. And we've come here to kill Belzenlock. Why are you telling everyone our plans? Can you shout a little louder? I'm sure there's at least one Cabal cultist in the countryside who didn't hear you. I'm not telling everyone, I'm talking to the commander of the Church of Sarah. She's the one with the wings. Oh, don't try to be sarcastic, you're not very good at it. And that doesn't mean you can trust her. How can you have survived this long and still be so naive? The Church forces trusted us in Caligo, and helped you with your particular problem. The least we can do is trust them in return. That isn't the least we can do. And we already know Belzenlock knows we're here. Lyra looked from Gideon to Liliana and back, one brow lifted. Thiago rode around them and offered her a folded packet. Commander Dawnbringer, this letter is from Rael, Battle Angel of Caligo, where she personally vouches for the necromancer Liliana. Lyra took the packet and opened it. Have they been like this the entire way from Caligo? <sighs> Yes, Commander. Every step. Lyra scanned the letter. Very well. You may enter the city. Why, thank you very much. With one hard flap of her wings, Lyra shot into the air. The other angels followed, the displaced air stirring Gideon's hair and making his horse stamp. While Liliana muttered rude comments, Gideon was just relieved to have the obstacle removed. He turned to Thiago. We need to find somewhere high up, the top of a tower. Do you have any suggestions? That I can help with. White banners flew everywhere, and they passed through a plaza with statues of Benelish heroes in gold-plated armor. After the morass, it was good to ride through a living city, bustling and energetic, with so many humans and avon in civilian clothing going about their business. There were still soldiers and knights, and even some of the giant winged horses being led through the streets. But while Benalia City was obviously well guarded, it wasn't under siege. Not, Not yet. yet. He would hate to see this place and the prosperous towns and countryside around it in the same state as Caligo. 
Thiago arranged for them to be allowed to wait at the top of one of the Benelish garrison signal towers, which also had a landing platform for the convenience of Angels and Avon. Gideon had told him only that they were waiting for a friend, but accustomed to the comings and goings of winged warriors, Thiago didn't seem to find this unusual. Thank you. It's the least I can do, after what you did for Caligo. Both of you, good luck. Gideon glanced at Liliana to see what effect this had on her, but she had already turned away. She took a seat on a stone bench near the platform. On the journey here, he'd been worried about her. She still hadn't spoken about her brother, and Gideon wasn't sure she had been aware that he'd heard Josu's last words to her. The chain veil had taken its toll, draining her strength, but they had had to leave for Benalia City almost immediately. He took a seat beside her. So, why did Johnny want to meet in midair? Gideon leaned back against the wall, easing his still sore shoulder. I don't know. I'm sure it's a good reason. I'm sure it's a pretentious reason. They waited long enough for Liliana to drift off to sleep. And then Gideon spotted something small and gold flitting through the air and stood, thinking it was a messenger. It landed on the parapet, and he saw it was a small, mechanical owl. That's some very complex mage work. And so is that. And then a giant skyship dropped down toward them. The argument started as soon as they boarded the weather light and went up the steps and into the spacious bridge. The front section, where the wheel and compass pillar stood, was almost all window and looked out over a spectacular view of Benalia City. Ajani barely gave them time to meet Captain Joyra, Shana Sisse, and Raf Capuchin before he spoke to Gideon. Where are the others? Why aren't they with you? Which forced Gideon to launch into a long and awkward explanation. Liliana stood there teeth gritted as long as she could take it. The long-buried part of her, who had remembered she was a daughter of the House of Vess, found it all very rude and disrespectful. Gideon was his usual annoying self, standing there explaining with apparent calm. At least he left out any mention of her brother, making it sound like they had laid the Caligo Lich to rest simply because it was the only way to defeat the Cabal Force. It was a relief. She could imagine Ajani might even be sympathetic, at least regarding Josu, and she couldn't stand the thought. His pity would be more than her temper could take, and Josu's reference to the Void still sent a chill through her bones. What could it mean? I was afraid of this. I don't know how we can defeat Nicobolus now. You should not have gone to Amonkhet. Liliana couldn't take any more. The chain veil was like a weight at her side, sapping her strength even this long after using it. She wanted a raging argument with someone, and Ajani was a much better target than Gideon. You might stop moaning at us long enough to listen to our plan. Or let us sit down. Gideon is still recovering from being wounded, you know. And not that you care, but I'm not feeling well either. The young mage, Raf, tried to offer them a seat, but Ajani turned his regretful gaze on her. I know most of this is because of you, Necromancer. You and your demons. Liliana, stop. Ajani, this was my decision, and I accept the consequences. Ajani turned back to Gideon, exasperation in his gaze, but his tone was still irritatingly calm. Accepting the consequences is admirable, but the damage has been done on Amonkhet, and there is no way to repair it. I can't argue with that. Liliana seethed. But at least Gideon's weaponized calm was aimed at Ajani. Maybe they could calmly more in sorrow than in anger each other until they turned to stone where they stood. Not a bad idea. And then she started to seriously consider how to make that happen. At least as far as Ajani was concerned. But we failed on Amonkhet because Liliana was still hamstrung by her demon pact. Once we kill Belzenlock, she will be free to use her full power against Nicol Bolas. 
You need to listen to me and not waste your time here. Ridding Dominaria of Bells and Lock is a waste of time. That is not what I meant. You didn't see what he did to Caligo. Everything I knew destroyed, turned to mud and rot. We have to stop. We have to- She realized abruptly she had said more than she meant to, that she had exposed herself terribly. The new people were staring at her sympathetically. Shauna, in particular, was nodding as if she understood perfectly. And it was all horrible. Liana folded her arms and lifted her chin, determined to brazen it out. I need to be free of my pact before I can fight your battles for you, Ajani. It's just that simple. Ajani didn't answer, merely studying her with his one good eye. We intend to continue the fight, Ajani. But we must destroy Belzenlock first. Ajani regarded Gideon steadily, and then his gaze moved back to Liliana. She knew she looked stubborn and angry and distressed, and tried to compose her expression into her usual contemptuous sneer. She wasn't sure she managed it. I see. I can't help you here. I must find more planeswalkers to join the battle against Bolas. We'll join you as soon as we can. Ajani gave him a grim, respectful nod. Take care. Golden shadows formed around him as he turned away, as if he stalked through a field of high grass. Then a heartbeat later, he vanished as he walked from the plain. Raph waved at the empty spot he had left. Bye, it was nice meeting you. Come again whenever you want to have an inexplicable planeswalker confrontation in front of total strangers. Shauna nudged him with an elbow. Not now, Raph. Gideon let out his breath and turned to Joyra. I'm sorry to argue on your bridge. Obviously, Ajani intended us to leave with him. If you'd like us to go... Not at all. Ajani may have his plans, but I've had this ship reconstructed for the sole purpose of fighting the Cabal, and destroying Belzenlock is an excellent first step. We'd welcome your help. Why? With effort, Liliana kept her tone inquiring instead of accusing. She didn't want to turn down help, and... She didn't want to leave this obviously comfortable skyship, but she didn't want to be fooled again either. What's your interest in killing Bells and Lock? I'm not a planeswalker. This place is my home, and my interest is in protecting it. I've been doing that since before the Phyrexian invasion. That was interesting. Liliana raised her brows. I'm older than I look. Shauna shrugged. I fight the Cabal in whatever form it takes. Getting rid of Belzenlock will make that much easier. Wrath waved. I'm new. I just started today, really. And you haven't met the others yet, but Tiana's an angel of Sarah, and Arvad's... Arvad. But he wants to destroy Belzenlock, too. Liana didn't sense any deception, and being an expert at deception herself, she should know. Part of her didn't want new allies. She wanted to be alone with her anger and the painful revelations about her family. But she knew that she was even more incapable of killing Belzenlock on her own now than she had been when they had first arrived on Dominaria. She glanced at Gideon. We all have the same goal, whatever our different reasons. Let's sit down and discuss how we can help each other. Joyra led them down the stairs to a compartment on the lower deck below the bridge. It was a wide room with a meeting table and more long windows looking out on the sky and the city below. They also met Tiana, the angel, who seems less arrogant than the other angels Liliana had encountered, and Arvon, who was an apparently reformed vampire. I know we'd be fools not to cooperate, but we need a new plan. My old one fell apart when our planeswalker allies left. I think we can get Chandra back, if we can find her. Even if she's still on Dominaria, her power isn't enough to get us into the stronghold. Without Nyssa, we don't have the brute force. And we still have to find some way to kill Belzenlock. Joyra steepled her fingers. We need information. I've been watching the Stronghold for years, and one thing I've learned is that its defenses are constantly changing, and the ways in and out are rebuilt on Belzenlock's whim. Liliana grimaced. The situation was even worse than she had expected. We need to capture a high-level Cabal agent. They report to Belzenlock personally 
They'll have information about the Stronghold's current structure, the traps that surround it, the best way to get inside. Would there be one here? Would the angels help us find one? The angels assigned to Benalia City search for agents and kill them. I don't think we'd find one alive here. Tiana's right. If there's anywhere in Dominaria where Cabal agents have no hold, it's Benalia City. We'll have to go somewhere else to find one. Oh, I know. The last time I was in Teleria West, there were rumors about Cabal agents in the Academy. It's not far, especially as fast as the weatherlight travels. We could be there before sunset, see if they've captured any- All this constructive discussion was making Liliana's mood improve in spite of herself. Also, traveling in fast comfort instead of traipsing all over by foot or horseback or boat sounded ideal. If they haven't, we may be able to flush one out of hiding. It's a good plan. Joyra glanced around the table. Then we're decided. To Talaria West it is. Barely half the day later, they were approaching Talaria West, and Liliana went out on deck with the others. She had a chance to sleep on a bunk in one of the comfortable cabins, and she felt less like something that had been chewed up by undead crocodiles. They had been traveling over an astonishingly blue sea, and now they were coming up on a series of low, wooded islands, surrounded by reefs and sandbars. On the shore of the largest stood the Talarian Mage Academy, a complex of white stone buildings and towers with steeply pitched red tile roofs. One high tower had a giant instrument built into it that looked very like an astrolabe, but probably wasn't. It was obviously the same sort of magic that had produced the mechanical wonders of the Weatherlight, Jorah's Owl, and the artificer's device Raph carried. By the time the Weatherlight arrived at the tallest tower, important-looking people were waiting for them on a broad balcony. The good thing about arriving in the Weatherlight, Liliana supposed, was that you didn't have to kill anybody to get the attention of the authorities you needed to speak to. As they drew close enough to see who was waiting there, Liliana sensed Joyra tense up. Problems? No. Just an ex-lover I wasn't expecting to see today. Ex-lovers are more trouble than they're worth. They disappear and don't tell you where they're going and ruin all your plans. She hadn't realized Gideon was in earshot. I'm sure that's not what happened. Jace would never- It's none of your business! The last thing she wanted was Gideon's opinion on her love life. In fact, the last thing she wanted was Gideon's opinion, period. They left Tiana and Arvad on the deck to guard the weatherlight, Tiana leaning on an enormous spear and Arvad's fangs gleaming in the fading sunlight. It was a precaution Gideon approved. Any Cabal agent who tried to steal aboard would find that they had come on the wrong skyship. As Gideon climbed down the ladder, the others stood on the broad stone balcony. A group of blue-robed Talarian academics waited for them. The strong sea wind pulled at their robes. In the lead were an older man with hard features and a deceptively young-looking mage with a mane of brown hair. Gideon didn't have any trouble guessing which one was Joyra's former lover. The young mage stepped forward, composed and cool. Joyra. Joyra tilted her head, her expression just slightly ironic. Joda. Raph interposed hastily and introduced the older man. This is Nabin, the Dean of Iteration. To what occasion do we owe this honor? Something about the man's tone said he was very busy and they were interrupting important work. Well, that's, that's too, too bad. bad. Gideon was in no mood to care. Their mission was too urgent. We found ourselves in need of information from a Cabal agent. Raph said you have a problem rooting them out of the Academy. Nabon lifted a reproachful brow at Raph, but Joda's expression went thoughtful. Give us a moment, please. They stepped away to talk. And what do you make of that? I think Raph was right about a problem with Cabal agents. There's been trouble here. They're nervous, upset. As they watched, Nabon appeared to be reluctantly convinced by Joda's argument. Joda stepped back over to them. I'm not sure how much we can help you. 
but there's something we'd like you to take a look at. Gideon stood with his arms folded, watching as Liliana took a seat on the next pallet and performed her spell. This corpse was another young woman, dressed in the blue and white robes of a student. The spell took hold, and violet sparks of light chased across the corpse's graying skin. Its eyes opened and it sat up, its gaze locked on Liliana. There you are. Now tell us what you saw. They were in one of the Academy's risk laboratories, a place where dangerous magical experiments were performed and strange magical objects examined. It took up the whole top of one of the larger towers, but so far they had only seen this main room, a wide, high, barrel-vaulted space, with narrow windows barred with metal and warded by magic. The light from the windows had dimmed as sunset approached, and glowing crystal globes, floating on little platforms constructed by artificers, hovered in the air. Lying on the floor were nine corpses, students and staff of the academy. It made a grim sight. Most of them were young, and from the expressions on their rigid features, they had died in torment. Raph was over at a table, examining the magical devices the murdered people had carried. Joda stood with Joyra and Shauna a few steps away, quietly answering their questions. The stairwell they were found in leads to the archives in three different laboratory towers. We have no idea which one the intruder was trying to reach. And there was no sound at all? He glanced at the bodies, regret obvious in the crease of his brow. Nothing. We're still attempting to assemble a timeline of events, but it happened very quickly. The corpse whispered to Liliana. Oh, turn to water. I sunk into it. I couldn't breathe. There were serpents in the water. Like the ones off the outer reef when I was young. They came at me. Yes, yes, but did you see anyone? A face you remember? No, the serpents. Liliana tapped it on the forehead. Never mind, then back you go. As the corpse sank back into immobility, Liliana pushed to her feet. It's dementia magic all around, I'm afraid. It has to be a cabal cleric, but none of the victims saw who cast the spell. Shauna had her arms folded, her brow furrowed. This isn't right. Liliana shrugged. You all said you wanted me to interrogate the corpses. No, not that. The whole situation... I've hunted Cabal agents in the cities of Dremora, and this is not how they operate. They're far more subtle than this. They have to be. Puzzled, Raph looked away from the devices on the table. I thought they were like berserkers. The Grimnants and other fighters, yes. But the agents have to be able to blend in, to get into the places or get near the people they want to spy on. She gestured at the line of bodies. Killing all those poor people in one go is something they certainly would do but it's also drawn too much attention. They failed to get into the archives or the other laboratories, and now the entire academy is alerted. Gideon thought it was a valid point, but Liliana didn't look convinced. Maybe it's just a very stupid agent. Cabal cultists aren't the brightest bunch, you know. Then why hasn't this one been caught yet? Gideon looked at the corpses again. He was certain Shauna was on the right track. So you think this was a distraction? But from what? Joy returned to Joda. There haven't been any other disturbances in the Academy? The two seemed much more reconciled to each other's presence with a problem to work on. Gideon found himself wishing Liliana and Jace could be that efficient. No, the entire Academy's been on alert, and we've sent warnings to the other islands. It did occur to us that this might have been an attempt to draw attention from another area of the Academy. Shana paced along the line of pallets. Can you tell us what exactly happened when the dead were discovered? What steps were taken? Healers were summoned to make sure there was no hope of revival. At the same time, the archives were searched thoroughly, and we made sure that certain seals remained intact. By that time, the healers had determined the victims were killed by spellcraft, so the bodies were brought here to this laboratory for examination. Brought by who, exactly? Uh, by the healers' assistants. Some students... Joda stopped, eyes narrowing. Joyra smiled. Oh, that's clever. 
Raph, guard that door. Gideon drew his sword. We need to search. It was a relief that their quarry might be nearby, trapped in this secure tower somewhere. But they had to be careful. This Cabal agent had nothing to lose now. Raph hurried to the main entrance to put his back against the heavy, carved doors. Uh, what exactly did we figure out? This place was the target all along. Gideon stepped into the open archway that led further into the laboratory's tower. The foyer was clear, no one lurking in the shadows. The agent killed these people so they would be brought here to be examined. This many victims would need at least twice as many attendants to carry them. We didn't count the students who came to help. We don't know how many came in and how many left. Do you have any idea what the agent might want here? Joy removed the stairwell to look upward, and Gideon joined her. There were six levels of tower above them, with balconies and landings extending out over the well. The staircase wound up, with no obvious support except magic, touching the walls only at the landings. The tower was complex, and seemed larger on the inside than it had appeared from the outside. It would be a long, difficult search, unless they could narrow it down. Uh, there's a great number of devices and partial devices stored here. It could be anything. What about ancient artifacts? This is Belzenlock we're talking about. He's not going to be interested in some artificer's newly created device. He's going to want something old he can use to aggrandize himself. That's right! All those titles he's given himself. Eternal Patriarch of the Cabal, King of Urborg, Lord of the Wastes, Master of the Ebon Hand. Yes, he's been taking credit for every shift in Dominaria's history, every ancient cataclysm, and he's collected artifacts to supposedly prove his claims. Is there anything here that's particularly ancient or famous? Or both? I think I have it. Come with me. Joda led them up the stairs past the third level to a balcony and then through an archway. It opened into a large, round chamber, with tall shelves leading back into shadowy depths. Is this the only way out? Joda signaled assent, and Gideon took up a guard position in the archway. As Shana drew her sword and stepped to Gideon's side, Joda strode to one of the shelves and lifted down a box. He cursed under his breath and showed the empty container to Joyra. (sighs) It's gone. But now we know we're right. Liliana stepped forward to look into the empty box. What was it? Quiet. Someone's in here. Gideon heard faint footsteps. Whoever's hiding here, come out. The silence stretched, and some almost imperceptible change in the air made it more and more obvious someone was in here with them. Then a rustle sounded from a library bay on the far side of the room. A young man in Talarian student robe stepped out of the shadows. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Magister. I-, I was just working here. I'm Tom, studying artificing with Dr. Arongi. Gideon lifted his brows. As an excuse, it was somewhat lacking. But he thought it was also something a young student might well do. Today? With a pile of murder victims in the main laboratory? <laughs> That's dedication. You're not one of the students assigned here. Tom moved forward, his expression contrite. I'm sorry. I helped carry the bodies in. One of the healers said more help might be needed, and so I stayed and I started to look at these texts. I just forgot myself. I've never been in this tower before. The young man seemed so innocent, he made Wrath look like a jaded rake. Gideon was tempted again to believe him. If I were a Cabal agent, this is exactly the way I'd want to appear. Joda appeared unconvinced. Joyra watched Tom like a hawk about to pounce. And what do you have in your hand, Tom? It's an artificer's device, isn't it? Yes, I found this lying on the floor where the others were killed. He started forward, lifting the device up. I... Meant to tell the healers, but... A dark globe of death magic appeared in the air and shot across the room toward Joda. Joy removed so fast it was like she had teleported. Suddenly in front of Joda, she flicked her fingers at the approaching globe. The air in front of her seemed to harden somehow, and when the globe struck it, it broke like a glass bauble. The fragments bounced back toward Tom. 
Gideon shouted and lunged forward, but Liliana was faster. Purple bolts shot from her hands as the lines on her skin flared. Tom took the hit in the chest and stumbled backward. But even as he flailed, he cast a spell of his own, enveloping Liliana in a black cloud. She gasped and staggered. Another cloud flowed toward Gideon almost immediately, but his sword glowed golden with his shield spell and turned the cloud back toward Tom. Shauna flung herself forward right through it. Gold sparkled around her as she slammed into Tom's chest. She knocked him flat, and Gideon stepped forward to kick the magical device away from his hand. Abruptly, Tom's struggles stopped, and his body went rigid. Gideon glanced back to see Joda stood beside him, one hand raised. He's harmless now. Gideon gave Shauna a hand up, and they both backed away. Joda gestured again, and Tom's body lifted off the floor. I'll take him down to the main laboratory where you can speak to him. He conducted the body out, and Joyra and Shauna followed. Are you all right? I saw something hit you. Liliana's skin was pale, and there were beads of sweat on her brow but her mouth twisted in the familiar expression of contempt. I'm fine. A little dementia magic hasn't much effect on me. You saw Josu, didn't you? Liliana glared at him. Then the glare faded, and she looked away. The cleric should have chosen something else. I see Josu all the time now. It's not a sign of weakness, so if you tell anyone about this- Yes, I know. Tear me limb from limb, unspeakable torments, and so on. Let's see what this Cabal agent has to say. In the laboratory's main room, Joda sent for Naban and the other Academy deans to hear the agent's confession. While they tried various magical means to get the information out of their captive, Jor found herself with a chance to talk to Joda. His expression was opaque, but she knew him well enough to know he would hold himself responsible for this breach of the Academy's security. You can't personally check all the students. Nine people died. Next time it could be more. He looked down at her, seeming to really focus on her for the first time. You could stay here and help us. With you and your friend Sisse, we could find every Cabal cultist in the Spice Isles. Jorah felt her jaw go tense. She's not Sisei. She's Shauna. And I have my own plans. His expression wry, Joda jerked his chin toward Liliana and Gideon. To help these planeswalkers? (laughs) Are you sure that they aren't taking advantage of you? Jora's pulse thumped in her temple. She didn't like the way he could make her angry this quickly. She didn't like the way he didn't seem to have an inkling that he was making her angry. I'm known for many things but I didn't think any of them involved being naive. Captain Jora, I have a spell that might help. Raph glanced across the room where Dean Nabon was glaring daggers at him. I'm not exactly supposed to have it, but I think it could be what we need. It involves drawing individual thoughts out of someone's brain. If I cast it while someone is asking him questions... Nabon strode across the room toward him. That spell is forbidden for good reason. It's dangerous, something only Master Mages should even know exists. Where did you learn it? Raph hesitated, looking from Joda's consternation to Naban's anger. I... I know as much as a Master Mage, I'm very advanced. Raph, do you like serving on the Weatherlight? Because I can just leave you here. Backed into a corner, Raph was falling back on old habits. Sorry, sorry. I snuck a look at the book I wasn't supposed to have access to, just the once. Sorry. Naban stormed off. But you can actually make it work? I can try. Joyra eyed him. She could tell he was being honest now. Then try. I can't stop you. Joda walked away. Liliana rolled her eyes. Oh, he disapproves. She glared at Gideon. I will not shut up and stop elbowing me. It's like being bumped by a mammoth. It was late at night when they climbed the stairs to the top of the tower where the weatherlight was docked. Gideon found it a relief to see Tiana perched on a railing. How did it go? We got our agent, and the information we need. Good! Arvad's making dinner. Liliana's mouth quirked. The vampire's making dinner. 
<laughs> it had been a long and trying day, but now at least they had what they needed to make a plan. As Arvad prepared a meal for them, they sat down at the big table in the compartment below the bridge and went over the information Raf's spell had uncovered. As Gideon paged through Joyra's notes, he saw it was going to take some time to figure it all out, as the spell had drawn out the answers to their questions in disconnected bits and pieces. He paused at an unfamiliar name. The Black Blade. What's that? It's a famous magical weapon. She was sitting across from him, nursing a cup of warmed wine. It killed an elder dragon. That was encouraging. Which one? Piru, I think. Shauna took a seat next to him. Never heard of him. Exactly. Liliana tugged the page away from him to read over it. So this black blade would kill Belzenlock? Easily. But it's a soul drinker, created with death magic. And it steals the life energy of everyone it kills. A soul drinker would be just the thing. Perfect for killing a demon like Belzenlock. If it's already absorbed the life force of an elder dragon, it should be more than powerful enough to do the job. Gideon wasn't surprised she wanted to use it. It sounded like just her sort of weapon. But he wanted nothing to do with it. A soul drinker is not something we would want to use. Under any circumstances. Liliana rolled her eyes at him, and he ignored her. It's also locked up in the stronghold. Before we decide if we want to use it or not, we need a way to get inside. Still glaring at Gideon, Liliana sipped her wine. If we could turn all the cultists and clerics to stone, it would be easy. I was thinking about turning people to stone earlier. Rath grinned at her. What, like, by stopping time? <laughs> if only we could. Joyra smiled, as if she had a secret she was ready to share. We can't, but I know just the time mage who can. Thank you for listening to this production of Voice of All. As listener-supported entertainment, we rely on you not just for the voices of the characters, but also to keep us going and growing. If you enjoyed what you heard, please support us by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, or following us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play, or just plain sharing with your friends. You can also support us financially on Patreon for exclusive perks. Return of Dominaria was written by Martha Wells. The podcast was produced and edited by Gin Dokeshi, with sound editing by Grace Noir. This week's story featured the voice talents of J.W. Forsyth, Sarah Ruth Thomas, In Rosiro, David Ford, Susie O'Neill, Sam Parrish, Michael Lanier, Michelle Rapp, Emily Doms, Keo, Ryan Wood, Ben Lyon, Madeline Parkinson, and Phoenix Madrone. Voice of All is unofficial fan content, permitted under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy. Magic the Gathering is copyright, Wizards of the Coast. Thank y'all so much for listening, and y'all have a great day.